As influencers in the kitchen for generations, female chefs have always brought traditions and new ideas to the table. And now, more than ever, they're bringing innovation and clout to individual kitchens and the communities they serve. Their creations continue to bring inspiration to new chefs daily. Find your perfect protein with Smithfield. For more information, visit smithfieldculinary.com. Happy International Women's Day and welcome to ACF Chefs Forum. As you know, it's important for culinarians to connect, to share, and to offer inspiration and mentorship within our community. And so we're excited to have guests here with information just for you, the leaders and future leaders of the food service industry. I'm Jackie Fressinger, American Culinary Federation's Director of Strategic Partnerships, and I'm delighted to welcome you to today's webinar and appreciate you tuning in as we focus on women in food service leadership. During this presentation, we'll be taking questions for the chefs live as we are able, so please use the chat function to collaborate with other chefs and students tuning in, and the Q&A function to post questions to today's featured guests. Okay, so let's get that conversation going in the chat. If you haven't already, please let us know where you're tuning in from today. And at this time, I'd like to welcome American Culinary Federation's National President, Chef Kimberly Brock Brown, to say a few words and welcome you to today's presentation. Hello, 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 everybody. Happy International Women's Day. As the first woman ever elected to serve on the, as the president of the largest profession, professional organization of chefs in North America, I'm honored to be representing the ACF on this important day throughout Women's History Month, March, in recognition and contributions of the ACF members and other women chefs that we have made throughout the industry for the greater good. Aside from showcasing, craft and passion for foods and the culinary arts, women have long been advocates for healthy food and nutrition, sustainability, and a better food system and food security for us all, as well as social justice, equality, and inclusion in the workforce. Now more than ever during these challenging times, women across all segments and positions in food service industries are rising up to push these agendas forward. But the fact remains, that there's still disparity since only 25% of chefs are women. So we know that this is a very important topic and we will not be able to cover everything that needs to be said or discussed in this next hour. However, we hope that this presentation sparks meaningful conversations in all of your kitchens. And at this time, I like to, as I'm sitting here in Middle Beast, ask you all to have a great conversation and to say, <laughs> thank you so much and thank you chef kimberly um at this time i'd like to introduce today's moderator my apologies that in the interest of time uh i've had to shorten her bio quite a bit since she's such an accomplished professional Anne McBride is Vice President of Programs at the James Beard Foundation, where she oversees JBF's initiatives around industry support, women's leadership, policy advocacy, sustainability, education, and scholarships. She holds a PhD in food studies from New York University, with research focusing on the changing role of the chef in the 21st century. A native of Switzerland and is the past chair of the James Beard Foundation Leadership Awards and past board member of the Association for the Study of Food and Society, New York Women's Culinary Alliance and Culinary Trust. We are grateful to have her join us today. And I could go on and on. You're such an amazing <laughs> colleague. But at this time, I'll pass the presentation over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jackie. It's always such a pleasure to collaborate with you and with, with ACF. Um, on advancing our industry in all sorts of ways. And happy International Women's Day to everyone. Um, this is also International Women's Month. We know, of course, we deserve 365 of those and 12 months of specialness, uh, but we're going to take today as a special celebration. It's such an honor for me to be moderating this conversation with four leaders truly in the industry. And the first question will allow them to introduce themselves a little bit more, but I'll uh, I'll just give their title to start with. Chef Lauren Desteno, Corporate Executive Chef at Alta Maria Group in New York City. 
Chef Virginia Willis, James Beard Award-winning cookbook author, food media personality, and health advocate. Chef Fiona R. Espana, pastry chef and president of ACF Chefs de Cuisine Association of California, Los Angeles. And Nina Curtis, author and a thought leader and trailblazer in the plant-based culinary movement. Welcome to the four of you. Thank you for joining us today and for this conversation that we're about to have. Um, so I'd love for each of you to start and tell me or to tell everyone in the audience, how would you say you show up as a leader in your daily work? And Virginia, you're off mic, so I'm going to start with you. Oh, okay. So um, you can hear me, right? Yes. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for that question. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here. I was, what a great question. Like, how do you show up every day? Because that's the whole point, right? We, it's not these lofty goals and aspirations. It's, it's really how you show up on, 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 on the computer, on the work, on the floor, on, on wherever you are every day. And one of my core values I have sort of recently discovered is kindness. And that is what leads me because I want to be the person that I want to be. And so whether that's dealing with uh, a, a, a pushy producer, um, a, a less than pleasant um, editor, uh, a, a purveyor that I'm having to deal with, a nice person, whatever that is, what I try to lead with is I try to lead with my core value of kindness and trying to be the person that I want to be. And I find that if I lead with that, then the leadership automatically follows because I'm being true to myself. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's the and and for mentioning core values, that's something um, Jackie and I are talking about about presenting on at the ACF convention this summer. For any of you who will be there, that is really important. And leading with your values is not as easy as it seems, right? Sticking to your core value is difficult. Yeah. Uh, Nina, let's go to you. How do how do you express leadership in your um, in your daily life in your daily work? How do you show up as a leader? Uh, thank you, Anne. Hello, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to be a part of what I feel is a very important conversation. And I'm sure as we go along, we'll learn more. I really work to show up in a collaborative manner because as a leader, we already have so much on our plate, but we've chosen, or I'll speak for myself, I've chosen to take that on, but I work to really check in with my team to see where everyone is at. So I don't get ahead of myself with all of the things I need to do. I like to be collaborative. I keep my team very much aware of what's happening in the moment. And if changes have happened. I, I always hear myself saying, you know, we turn on a dime, but I also try to be careful with that because I think that's something that's expected in our industry, but I like to check in and see where everyone's at, make everyone feel like I'm listening to you from the start. And that pretty much works for me in the kitchens that I've worked in and continue to work in. So thank you. Thank you. Lauren, let's go to you. Okay, hi, thank you all for having me and it's such an honor to be on this with, with my fellow colleagues here. Um, I think for me, the way that I show up is trying to be the best representation of what I wanna see in all of our team and having that just be you know, an example to go by. Um, I think also to Nina's point is, you know, kind of in the same vein is just trying to be as prepared as possible for them. How can I best set them up in the day for success? How can I come in, check in with them, see where they're at so that I can help them push through. I can help them reach the goal that we have collectively as a team um, faster and with uh, more ease and really be approachable and available. The worst thing that I could be as a leader is someone that nobody wants to approach or ask questions to, or, you know, ask for advice or ask for, you know, opinion or help. Um, so I think approachability also ranks really high on, on how, I how I show up daily. Thank you. Fiona, what about you? Uh, hello. Um, so basically I think the first thing with me is um, when I wake up, I'm a mother, so I really have to show up um, regardless of the situation. 
good, bad, my back hurts, my feet hurt, you still have to be there for them, uh, for your team and give them that support. Um, basically like morning affirmation of like, you guys are amazing. We're here for each other and I'm here regardless of what the situation is from last night or yesterday's events. Um, so I take, I take the mama approach. You're gonna be there and having a great mom, um, a boss mom, she always was there for us regardless of what we did, good or bad. Uh, it's that, that support that you give on a daily basis. I like the uh, the mom metaphor, and this is making me think of Queenie Reed, who is a LA chef, and she's a graduate of our Women's Entrepreneurial Leadership Program. And we were having a conversation around the need for transparency with your team, and you know the the fact that having them know what's going on and why you're taking certain decisions uh, is really important, right? And there's a big movement led by women towards more transparency. But and that ties back to the. The, me the parents metaphor, as parents, you don't say everything to your kids. And there are certain things they don't need to know, right? So that's, a, you can mother, but it doesn't mean that you're, um, yeah, it, it means there's boundaries still, right? And that's an important element. Um, Virginia and Lauren, I want to go back to, you mentioned, Virginia, you mentioned values, and Lauren, you mentioned modeling, basically. Do you do this as a conscious exercise where you set time for that because very often what's challenging when making leaders creating a leadership environment and a leadership culture is you as a leader making the time for this for the framework you need to put in place right to to show up in the right ways so do you have a um a, a conscious process that you follow once a month once a week every six months where you sit down with yourself basically and sketch out the what you want to show up for your team or for yourself in, in around your values or around your your modeling or does it just happen lauren do you want to go first sure um well i think for me it happens probably about once a month we um, I have meetings with our, our chef teams at the restaurant and in preparation for that meeting, it takes a lot of me looking back on what I've accomplished or missed, <clears throat> excuse me, in that past month. So that definitely is how, you know, I kind of hone in or select the things in my modeling that I'm lacking in, um, while also using them as examples for the team. You know, it's, it's one thing, one thing we were just talking about in our meeting last week is if someone's doing something wrong over and over again, but you haven't gone over and physically shown them how to do it correctly, you really can't get mad because not everyone learns the same way. And it means that you're not putting in the full effort to try to help that person achieve what you need them to achieve. So, you know, it, it starts with me looking at myself and seeing what I've kind of either been lax in or or maybe feel like I've done well, um, and then putting that out for the team. So I would say it happens about once a month. Yes. Okay. What about you, Virginia? That's such a great, such a great question. And I remember a million years ago in culinary school, and that was such a great example, Lauren, because when uh, my chef was showing me how to do a cut, like they would make the cut and put it in the top left-hand corner of the cutting board. And if mm -hmm. they came back and my Brunoise wasn't the perfect one, eight by one, eight by one, eight, then they would just point to the top of their cutting board. And it's it, that is stuck with me 25 years later. I, I work in a very different situation than many of you. I, I don't have a, a, a working kitchen all the time and my projects sort of swell and wax and wane, so to speak. I, my work and uh, personal life are so much intertwined, like many of us. I actually look at this on a daily basis. At the end of every day, I look at my day and I see what kind of person I was, what kind of leader I was. Was I um, setting the people working with me up for success? Because if I'm setting the people up for, that are working with me up for success, then I'm setting myself up for success. So it really, it has become as part of this help journey that I've been on, um, having the, the daily attention to it. Um, you know, I'm not brooding on it, right? But just like, hey, what? Did, how did I do today? And it's literally a, a check mark, good to go, a line, I did okay, or an X, I need to do better tomorrow. And so I'm consciously thinking at the end of every night, what what do I need to do to be a better leader, person, chef, cook, 
tomorrow. The, the, this really shows the, we talk a lot about data, right? In our industry and data collection around uh, customers and all these things, there's so much information that floats around. Um, and two things around that. One is you need to spend, to take time to analyze the data and make use of the data. Um, and then yourself are a source of data, right? I like this checklist system. And then you can look back at a month and say, all right, there were a lot of X's this month or this week. What can I do differently for the next one? So carving this time here is really important. What is, um, have you found yourself to naturally arrive to leadership position or was there a moment where you specifically decided, all right, you know, either I have the, the I'm an innate leader or I need to work on it, but I want to be leading. Um, what was that moment? And then what can someone who wants to be more of a leader make use of your experience there? Fiona, let's start with you. Um, growing up, I've always been in a um, ASB, kind of like trying to take the 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 route of like just minor leading or like um, supervise or just kind of like tiptoeing around. Like, I want to make a little change. I want to make I want to make progress. Like, how do I do that? Like, if they're not doing what I like, then how would I make those changes? You know, and I realized that. You can do like a lead, a lead position, um, make changes, but the big changes are at the higher levels. And I kind of just kept pushing forward and like making the, I guess, like the climb on the ladder of like, how high do I want to go? Should I just go all the way? And, you know, do I, am I going to fall or is is it going to be an accomplishment of like, at least I tried, um, take the, I guess the plunge of like, people are going to criticize you regardless of what you do, good or bad. Um, so I might as well try to make uh, a change in anything, right? And I see my children watch me. So I'm like, do I be scared? Am I going to be the scared one? Um, or be the role model for my kids, for my team, and say, you know what, if she could do it, I could do it. And that's at um, female or male, you know, because I know people get intimidated by, uh, oh, well, they have a culinary school, they went to a really good one, I only went to technical school, or I've only done minor things. But to be able to just take the plunge and just keep going, um, I think was kind of in, in, in my groove of like, just make the change, just do it. And someone will follow along. And even if you're outside the box, someone's gonna wanna do the same thing. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, good, it's a good feeling to say, okay, at least I tried, whether it may be a failure for me or it just didn't work out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, taking a risk there and leading with that. Nina, what about you? How did you find yourself a leader? Well, I'm the eldest of four, <laughs> so I didn't have a choice. <laughs> but through that, um, I was the one that probably got in trouble the most because I was setting the rules or figuring it out and misbehaving. And not knowing that, but being curious, right? And then having younger siblings that would either come along with me. But as I moved into, I also found that I'd kind of be the leader in my friend group, or it would be like, well, Nina, you go try this. And that then in school, I just excelled in school because I like school. I like learning. I think it's a gene and a character. But the main thing I found when I got into my work adult life, very early on, I found out if I take a leadership role, I can make difference or I can make a change or I can, as Shafiona said, you know, if someone sees me doing it, maybe then they're like, well, I can do it. But the most important thing I learned very early on is I can't make change if I'm not at the table where change is being made. And it hasn't always been easy. It hasn't always been accepted or received. It's kind of when you sit at the table, you know when you're not really being heard, but you've been given the mic. So for me, 
I, I'm quite competitive. I competed for a decade in natural bodybuilding and I compete with myself. I show up for myself and I feel like anyone else that can see that, as Virginia said, you know, am I better than my best each day I'm given to be that, but that's for me. And I feel like if anyone else can benefit from it, whether it's mistakes I make or, you know, moving forward, someone can see that. So I'm always the one that stands on the edge and I'll jump because I know I get my wings <laughs> if I just jump. So that's kind of where I've come into this leadership. And I'm working in this life to not take responsibility for everyone, because I think that's an important thing as a leader. We take on a lot of responsibility. So I also think we have to be mindful of what responsibility is really ours and when to let it go, just like a leader has to know how to delegate, right? That's a really important point. Um, put on your oxygen mask first, right? Because if you are not in the right place and the right ability, you cannot be a good leader. And if you take on everyone's responsibilities, you forget yours um, and you can't prioritize yours. So very important lesson. Virginia, let's hear from you. How did you find yourself in leadership positions and as a leader? Well, I laugh when Nina said that she was the oldest. So I'm an oldest too. I, I don't had, didn't have four younger si siblings. Um, I think that for me, it just, I just was drawn to do, I, and I don't know how to say it any other way than that. I think it, I think there was a lot of, uh, personality. Um, but, but for example, it's like when I set my mind to something, then I, throughout my career and, and even still to this day, when I set my mind for something, I set a goal and typically they're pretty high goals and, and up, upper, upper reaching goals. And, um, I work towards that goal. And then I have a sneaky habit of as soon as I get close enough, then I move it. Right. So I just keep trying to keep trying to aspire. There's one phrase that I say to myself very often, and, and I try to share it with people, people that I work with or people that just are, are there. Um, you might fail if you try something, but you can guarantee that you're going to fail if you don't try. And that has just been something that's at the at, at, the, at my core. Um, and I truly believe if if I set myself up with uh, the the proper tools and the proper education, then I am capable. And I think that that's a, a belief. And there are many 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 things that I am uncertain about. There are many things that I don't know what I'm doing. But the one thing that I can always return to in my life is that I know that I'm a good cook and that grounds me in my life. Mm -hmm. It really truly does. And that allows me to, um, to do the job that I do. What you just said makes me think, you know, that you, you accept that there's a lot of things you don't know, right? And, and the, there's this statistic that men apply to jobs when they're 60% qualified or something like that. And women only when they're hundred percent qualified. So this accepting that you're not, you don't process a hundred percent of everything, but still step up, right. And still take a risk and say, all right, I'm going to apply to that job. I'm going to take this on. I'll learn to fill in that gap, but I have enough there. That's hugely important. You. Lauren, what about you? How did you find yourself a leader? Are you a firstborn too? Uh, Actually, I was laughing because I am the last born. Yeah. But um, <laughs> there has, <laughs> excuse me, there's quite a substantial gap between myself and my two older siblings. So I think mine was kind of this false idea that I was their age and I could do what they could do. Yeah. And I just never kind of looked back. I mean, I was the person that would try out for everything and I would try anything once and give anything a shot. And, you know, I played lacrosse in college and I, you know, played competitive sports my whole life. But I think back to in high school trying out um, for the high jump competition, uh, the track team, and I'm five, three and a half. So that was definitely not going to be my sport. So I went after it anyway and just kind of, you know, did it and didn't really work out, but that was just, you know, Hey, I tried that and I moved on. So for me, I think it's just having almost this lack of concern about what happens after, um, and just taking that risk and trying it because, you know, was I really dead set on being a high jump star? Absolutely not. 
but I was glad I tried it. It was something interesting to try. And then I moved on to the next thing. Um, I think, you know, also it, it also does lead back to, to what, you know, I, I always did have cooking to fall back on. That was the thing that was always my passion. Um, but I, I also have the bad habit of kind of setting my sights on something. And then right when I'm about to, just like you said, when, right when I'm about to achieve it, I, I'm like, okay, that's done now. Next thing. Um, and just always pushing towards something new. Um, I think it's also the, the idea of not getting bored and not feeling stagnant. Not that, you know, any job, you know, any job you can find countless things to do on a daily basis, but constantly learning and constantly being curious and, um, putting myself in those positions to take on those roles and take on those tasks. Uh, so I think part of it was just a bit of foolhardiness and not really knowing how old I was and what I was doing, but, um, just going after it anyway and not being afraid to take those risks. So if there's one takeaway from those four answers to anyone watching today, that thing that you're not, you haven't done yet because it's all risky and you're not quite daring, decide today that you're doing it, that you're taking that risk, that you're making that change. You've invested an hour of your time for this webinar, do that risk, take it. Um, you've all mentioned failures and that's a big part. There's so many lessons that we learn and when we fail at something, right? Um, I'd love for the four of you to share one example of failure, and I'll let you decide who goes first, depending on what you're comfortable sharing. But what's what's one thing you tried? It failed, and yet you still learned a lot, and it allowed you to grow. Not everybody jump in at once. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it. I'll go first. Uh, one of the biggest failures of my whole entire career is that I was green lighted uh, for a show, a PBS show on um, out of WGBH, the same station that gave Julia Child her first show, right? It was tremendous. It was absolutely tremendous. And I was so excited and it felt like the biggest accomplishment in the world. Um, and then we went out to get funding and I couldn't get the funding and it crushed me. It absolutely crushed me. This is this dream that I've had. My first job cooking was on a TV cooking show working for Natalie Dupree. I was the kitchen director for Martha Stewart. I was the kitchen director for Bobby Flay. I've been behind the scenes in television kitchens since I was 22 years old, right? So 23 years old around there. Um, so having this opportunity to be the person finally in front of the camera and have it so close and yet not be able to secure that and to finally swallow that failure, to realize this is not going to happen. And, and this is one of the biggest ones in my life, right? And every other goal that I set for, I wanted to work for Bobby, got it. Wanted to work for Martha, got it. Wanted to work in France, got it. You know, all these things. And so this was a big one. And it was a lot, a lot to absorb. But I also realized that that failure does not have to define me. Just because I didn't get that opportunity or I wasn't able to do the work to achieve that opportunity, right? It wasn't that it just didn't happen. It was I tried. Um, I have competed in the cooking competitions, et cetera, et cetera. You just, the thing to learn, I think, from failure is when you're trying to go into a situation that you want to achieve something, is to set yourself up with the best plan of success. Give, give yourself your mise en place. Get your mise en place ready. Get your tools ready. Execute a plan. And then we all mess up. We all burn a dish. We all leave something in the oven too long. We all dare get PBS cooking shows, right? But all you can do is set yourself up with the best opportunity for success with your tools. Give it your best effort. And then accept the outcome and try to learn from it as best as possible. Thank you. That's an unfortunate, but very good example. Um, don't let it define you and move on to the next thing. When... Yeah, something better is coming. Yeah. Fiona, you're off mic. Did you want to go next? Yeah. Um, it kind of reminded me of um, my first competition, a uh, uh, pastry competition. Um, I thought I got this. I got this in the bag, no problem. Um, it was in uh, March of 2019, and I I thought I I was ready. And my mentor said, 
you better practice. If you don't practice, you're going to fail. And I was like, okay, chef, I got it. Like, don't worry about me. Like, I'm good. I've done this. And he said, okay, um, these competitors are really good. They're really good. And I'm like, okay, like, how good can they be? <laughs> so when I get there, I had my a couple of bags, um, mise en place, right? And I go into the room and it's full of speed racks, um, mise en place to the T. I mean, the very last ounce of flour, sugar, uh, 15 whisks, whatever it was, they were like, what in the, what, what is this? Like, I wanted to just like turn around and get out of the room. Cause I was like, I'm not prepared. Like they am, like they were. And, um, I was like, I told them, I was like, I don't know if I could do this. And he was like, you already signed up. You got to finish. Like you got to go, go out there. And I was like, mm, it's not going to happen. He's like, go, go, just do it. Just put something out there. And then it's just got scary. Like I'm watching these people, they know what they're, I like almost froze up. And um, it was hard to watch them because I was in a maze of like, wow, they're doing really good. And then I'm over here like, uh, you know, like just, soup, just stuck, just stuck. And how do I get out of it? So he said, put something out there, anything, you know, like you have four items. If you have two, put two out there. And I was like, you're right, you're right. I ended up putting out three items. Um, I got a participation award. Thank you very much for coming. We appreciate you coming out. And um, I don't, I wasn't embarrassed, but I, I really didn't know what I was getting into. And um I think uh, that was kind of like a turning point to say, you you don't know what 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 people really prepare for. Like you are going in there, they're going in there. Who's more prepared, you know? And it's okay that like I bombed, I missed stuff. I mean, I I thought I had my mise en place, but I really didn't have my mise en place ready. Um, and a month later, it. I was, uh, I took my certification um, for pastry chef and I did great. And um, that helped me prepare for that. And that was a turning point of like mise en place means so much in every level, like be ready, be ready. Cause you don't know what's gonna happen. <laughs> so it was a major turning point of like just being prepared in the kitchen. You can never be over prepared. I imagine there are a lot of people watching who have felt exactly what you felt at that moment. So. <laughs> Nina and Lauren, what about you? What's one failure you're comfortable sharing that has been a big lesson for you? You know, it's interesting that failure term because I think it's such a mindset. And again, I'll go back to my childhood and how I was brought up. And then I'll use Nelson Mandela, his saying, I'm either winning or I'm learning. And in every experience that one could define as failure, I defined as this is a learning experience. And I'm not trying to be facetious and get around it. But just as Fiona said, a month later, she was prepared with her mise en place. And in my life, that has been such a truth and testament that something I might have called failure, but I don't even have that word really in my vocabulary. Um, because I'm either winning or I'm learning. And since I compete with myself, I know that, well, Nina, were you as prepared as you could have been? Did you show up as best you could have been? But still at the end of the day, for me, it is a learning. And I think that for me is that being kind to myself because I'm so demanding of myself. Mm -hmm. And I think as leaders, we can set ourselves up so far that we kind of lose sight sometimes of, was that a win or was that a learn? But for me, a failure is a learn that I have found, like Fiona said, somewhere around that corner, something showed me that that wasn't for you anyway. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a very important thing to check in, especially in the climate that we're in today and how our young people and our future of our industry looks at things like 
because there's so many impressions coming at us and we are making decisions about our success based on what we see someone else is putting out there that could be a whole facade that I think it's really important to be careful of the words that we use and how we define ourselves and our journey and our experience compared to someone else's. So I'm winning or I'm learning. Love that. Thank you. That's very impactful. It's fantastic. Lauren. Um, I think mine is a little, is fairly similar to Fiona. Um, we were working an event, a large event here in New York City, and there was uh, a very, you know, well-known chef had come to help us do it. And um, when I do events, I am, you know, obsessive in checking how many of each item we have. Do we have enough? Do we have more than enough? Do we have extra in case someone, you know, pulls something random out that they might want? And I had everything I needed and we arrived at the event and we started putting out all the plates and then something happened and somebody else misplaced some of our product and not all the plates went out the same. And I know it sounds maybe like not a huge deal, but people that are in this industry, you can all, uh, I would imagine, appreciate that feeling of, I, first of all, I was absolutely mortified and it was an just an awful, awful day for me. And, you know, maybe the guests didn't realize, but I knew, I knew that those last 10 plates weren't, didn't have the same amount of protein that the, you know, previous 70 had. Uh, and were we plating in a hallway? Yes. Were we using hot boxes <clears throat> with no electricity? Yes, that's fine. But um, at the end of the day, I was the one responsible, regardless of who, was you know helping me pack up our items to bring to the area we were plating from um any of those things but uh you know i didn't really have a good silver lining from that experience other than when your name is on the line when you are the person that is going to be responsible at the end of the day for what's happening um you do need to be over prepared is kind of my was my takeaway from that that ex that experience and uh, you can't blame it on anyone else. No one else in that room knows that so-and-so is the one that misplaced the rest of your mise en place. All they know is that your name was on the menu and you were the one that was putting it out. So um, you need to be, you know, hyper-vigilant about all of that, all of that, those components, uh, because every single one matters, particularly when your name's out there. So um, it just never, that never happened again. <laughs> that never happened up until that moment and has never happened again. So just being hyper vigilant about, about overseeing everything um, and making sure that everything is accounted for and everyone is, is on point, uh, particularly in, in situations like that. Yeah. Yeah. That becomes a learning, not just for you, but for your team, obviously. Right. And I imagine there were some conversations that happened after that mm -hmm. on what's in it for them too. Um, yeah. I want to switch a little bit. There are a lot of men who are watching today and listening. And some of the questions that came on from list from um, attendees before the, the webinar were asking how they can how men can be can mentor better, can create environments, kitchen environments that are better for women, that are more conducive to more diverse kitchens, period. Right. Um, so what it what do you all have to recommend there? What is something that men can do that you feel would make a difference in terms of having more women in the kitchen period, more women as leaders in kitchens period and kitchens or our industry also? Um, what's either an example of a man uh, who made a difference in your career or something where that they did not provide a good example or did not provide a conducive environment that would have made a difference? Go ahead, Lauren. Um, personally, I, again, this kind of comes back to my upbringing. I never, I never viewed myself as different from anyone else, but something that I have recognized of late, especially, is that not everyone feels the same that I do. And I just assumed that if people weren't getting somewhere or not, not they weren't getting somewhere, but they weren't achieving certain, certain areas was because they that wasn't a goal of theirs. Um, 
but I have come to find out and realize that is not the case. I think being approachable is number one, um, absolutely the most important thing. I mean, I have had an absolutely amazing boss. Uh, Amas Fakahani is the owner of our company and I've worked for him for 13 years. And there's a reason why I've worked for him for that long. Um, he doesn't treat anyone differently than anyone else. However, everything that happens is based on merit. So especially in today's world, you really cannot assume that because something is not offensive to you or doesn't make you uncomfortable or that you find something funny, that anyone around you is going to feel the same way. And the way that I explain this to our staff is it doesn't matter if we put a, de a dish out that we believe is perfect. What matters is the perception of the customer. So for them, if they don't perceive it in the way they were hoping it was going to be, then it's not perfect in their eyes. And it's the same way when you're in a, a kitchen with, with women, with people from different backgrounds, um, there's different identities all around you. And you really need to be, you know, again, I'll use that word vigilant, but also very aware that just because something is of interest to you or is funny or, you know, okay to you doesn't mean that it is to the person next to you. So I think self-awareness is a, it goes a long way. Um, and again, just being completely approachable and, and asking people, checking in, you know, how are you doing? How do you feel today? Some people are completely afraid to go to anyone above them and, and speak with them, but, you know, pulling them aside, asking them how things are going, commenting on how they did something really well. You know, you did this really well, exceptionally well. Where, where did you work before? How did you learn this skill? Uh, that goes a long way. Thank you. Fiona, do you want to go next? Sure. Um, I, I, I think what um, the culture, right? Our, our culture for the kitchen is different in um, between restaurants, hotels, uh, golf course, senior living, they're, they're a little different. Um, I've worked in quite a few different kitchens. And um, in the beginning, I, I knew that it was uh, very raw, very harsh. You know, like uh, having that support. Um, I don't know if it was really there, but I would continue to push forward, you know, like to get to get to where I am now. Um, but I know that like in the beginning of my years, I said, you're not going to make me feel uncomfortable. I'm going to make you feel uncomfortable. OK, because I just wanted to keep moving forward. And now now. Um, I think what is really important is soft skills, right? And this is in any industry, listening, communicating, um, and being empathetic, right, of anybody's situation. Um, I know that, like, again, kitchen culture, uh, a lot of addicts, addiction, um, and their, the professionalism is a little different, you know, what we would consider different, you know, like what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. Um, but being able to support their creativity is very important. And I know that's what has helped me grow in the kitchen. So when I know that I have a really good boss, it's because they kind of gave me that like, you know what, just create you know, something in the budget or create something with whatever we have. And I was like, wow, okay. Like I was super excited for that creativity and um, basically supporting um, what I wanted to do. You know, even if it wasn't in their, their thought process, but you know what, we'll give them a little bit and see how, how, how it aligns with us. And um, I felt like, you know what, that's what helped me grow and um, kind of go to that person and say, hey, let's talk about, uh, besides the menu, hey, you know what, this is what's going on, and I feel safe with my boss, or I feel safe with the leaders, the leadership and the management. Um, so when I took that and said, okay, I need to put that in place, now that I'm in charge of, you know, a staff of 30 or whatever it was, of being able to be safe for them, uh, being their safe spot, 
and kind of just supporting their creativity for those that needed it. Because not all of your kitchen staff wants to just create a, a new appetizer or um, a dessert or anything like that. Some of them are just really great at production. So you say you encourage them and continue to say, you're doing a great job. Um, so for me on either end, female, male, it's supporting them creativity uh, with their creativity, uh, being empathetic uh, in each of their situations. Thank you. Virginia, let's go to you. What is one difference that men can make? One of the most impactful experiences I had in my whole entire career, it was a, a dinner that I did um, at Highlands in Birmingham with um, Chef Frank Stitt. And that kitchen is clean and that kitchen is buttoned up. And I was, I was right before service and there's like, I don't know, 100, 125 people. I was the guest chef, nervous as you know what, right? I'm not a restaurant chef. I mean, I'm a good cook, but I'm with, I'm in Frank Stitt's kitchen, all the things. And um, there was a, a, a server talking loudly to another server. They were kind of like in an altercation. Um, and Pardis, uh, director of front of house and uh, Frank's wife, she just glanced at the server and immediately the volume dropped. And what struck me about that moment and being in that kitchen was respect. It's just respect. I don't wanna be respected any differently because I'm a woman. I don't wanna be respected any differently because I'm gay. I don't want anything different or any special privileges or whatever. And so the thing that I think that is the most important about what men, what leaders, let's just say leaders, because not all leaders, not all the men are leaders, but what leaders can do is just to create that environment of respect, respect for the ingredient, respect for the equipment, respect for the space, respect for the time, respect for one another, respect for the customer and respect for their money. And that's gonna look different in different kitchens. Obviously uh, fine, uh, fine dining, white tablecloth might be a little bit different than a burger joint, but does it have to be, right? It doesn't have to be, um, you know? And so that would be the thing that I think is the, the, the most important piece about what men, what leaders in this injury, industry can do to um, further people that may have less opportunities, whether that be uh, diversity, inclusion, et cetera, a woman, et cetera, is just to offer a place where that everyone is put on the same plateau of respect. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Nina, what about you? I'll keep it sweet and succinct. I think culture is everything. And as it's already been said in different ways, can someone walk into your kitchen, in your culture, in your restaurant right now and be able to be their best and be able to flourish? And that isn't a male, female thing. That is just leaders. And that is my success of my business. And so are you prepared, as it's already been said, no matter who the person is, I'm a female, presenting. I happen to be a chef in my profession. So I have to already pass all the requirements to be hired, lift 50 pounds, be able to move around, stand on my feet. If I've passed that to be hired, I don't look for any special um, treatment. And I know there are different cases, but I think culture is everything and not what can I do to bring this people in? What am I doing that is inviting and diverse enough, even if my team isn't yet diverse, for anyone to be able to come in and be able to perform their best? Thank you. I think the, the summary from what all of you have said is th this idea of self-awareness and things are changing in this idea of culture and flourishing. So if you don't have women in your kitchen right now, or uh, if your kitchen looks only one way, are you creating the environment that is inviting to other people? Um, are you set in your ways and doing things the way you've always done them? Well, the world is changing, right? And this is an industry where there's constantly a newer generation coming in. Are you answering the needs and requests of the current generation of workers for your restaurant? So taking a good look at your culture, it, it will be painful in some cases, but that's really an essential thing to do if you want to change um, and if you want to support uh, women and others in your kitchens who might not be the people you've traditionally supported. 
Uh, we do have a couple of minutes for audience questions if anyone wants to ask them, but otherwise following um, Jackie's timeline, um, we are approaching final thoughts on the topic. So I'm just looking through my list of questions to see if there's any guidance I can provide on final thoughts or just maybe ask each of you to reflect on what do you want the main takeaway around leadership and women in the industry to be for the audience today? What's the one, what do, what do you wish that anyone watching today does a little bit differently tomorrow? I'll go, I'll go first. Um, I think uh, when it comes to like what we can do different or uh, basically what, what, how, how do I continue this, right? Um, and make it like a broader spectrum on everyone else so that they'll do, you know, like follow along or continue because it's a big, it's a big, um, it's a big uh, window, right? Because we're like, we're there. And then there's, there's no one else to like, kind of like, there's one person filling in as, as a woman. And then we're trying not to say, oh, just it's a woman. Um, you know, like how, how do we continue it on? You know, like what's the support? Uh, for me, I, I feel like if I put on my eyelashes one at a time, if I braid my hair by myself, um, anyone can do it. You know, like it's not, it's not just women or men or um, uh, anything in that sense. It's just everyone does it one day at a time, one step at a time, and that we're here to support you um, to continue on because I'm the first female president for the Los Angeles chapter in over 90 years. Um, I just took the step, you know, and I hope that we have many more leaders that will just take the step. Thank you. That's a good takeaway. Lauren? I think, um, you know, nowadays, um, even more so, and, and as the days goes on, go on, um, it's not just women, it's just treating everyone equally, because there are so many more groups now um, that always were there, but we're, we're finally shedding light on different groups of people and people that maybe are not as represented, even as women are. And for me, something that I always try to, um, you know, explain to our team is that you can have four people in front of you and give them all the exact same direction at the same time. And you're going to get four different results from that co one conversation. And that has nothing to do with women or men or background. It's just, it's just people and people coming from different backgrounds and you know, I'm in New York City. We have people from all over the world working here. And it's being conscious of the fact that your messaging needs to be clear for the person that's receiving it. And when that is the case, and when people understand that you're trying to communicate to them in a way that they can best receive it and in turn produce the best result for you, it's going to make a much more inclusive environment. The culture is going to be that much better. Um, and everyone is going to feel equally respected and um, is going to feel like they're all in the same even playing field. That's a really important point also to make that this is not, a lot of this is not just applicable to women, right? For sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Virginia or Nina, whoever wants to go. Thank you, Chef. Sure. Thank you, Virginia. You know, when I think about it, I always, Every day I pull the lens back and remember that no matter what category, if you will, of the restaurant industry we're in, we're in the larger industry of hospitality. Mm -hmm. And so I always remind myself as we talked about showing up, I show up first to serve. And I do that because I love serving. It's like I you know, think about if you were to come to my home and I was going to cook you my favorite meal, 
I think about that feeling I have. And I think we don't think about that enough. Most of us got in this industry at the end of the day because we love to cook and we love to feed people. And so how do I feed my team, my first customer as a leader, as a manager? And then how do we all as that team extend out and serve and feed body, mind, and spirit, I'm going to say, our customers, our guests, depending on the environment you're in, how we call a guest, a customer, you know, someone we serve. I think that's one, so sorry, one important thing that we need to really, or I, I keep in mind that I'm in the service industry and I chose to be in it. And if I lean in with that intention of serving, then I'm always thinking about how can I serve the best? If someone says, oh, I'd love you to mentor me, why? Why do you want me to mentor you? Tell me how I'm going to serve you the best if you want me to mentor you. So I say that to the young people, to our future, know why you want to be in this industry, know what it means to serve and pull the lens back and look at all the opportunities. If 2020 taught me nothing, it taught me to stay ready so I don't have to get ready and to be open. I love the kitchen environment. I love being in it. I thrive in it. But I also had to learn to be in my own home kitchen in front of a camera with the lights right, with my mic and have my mise en place in place. So mise en place, I think, is carried out through our life. Be organized before you step out your own door. And so, you know, I'll leave it there. But thank you for the opportunity to be here and share my thoughts and ideas. Thank you, Nina. That's you so that is so beautiful. Stay ready so you don't have to get ready. I have taken a bunch of notes here. I'm sure that everyone has. Um, I would just so many incredible, so much incredible advice from all these in, incredibly talented folks. Um, we have an expression in the kitchen, you know, the, the fish starts rotting at the head. And uh, I have used that definitely more in my life. But since it's got such a negative connotation, I would just like to say, like, the flower starts with a small seed, right? So the beautiful flower starts from a small seed. And we have we, you know, regardless of whether it's a restaurant, a production company, TV show, uh, Nina is exactly right. We just, we want to feed, feed people. We want to serve people. Um, and it's a community, right? And if, if a, as leaders, as people who are trying to draw different people into the kitchen and into the seats, um, it, it, you know, the, the, the community is only as strong as the weakest link. So we have so much opportunity here um, to continue the great path that we're all on. Thank you. One important element was this idea of service, and I love how you all are framing it, is we are in a service industry and we serve others, but that is not at the expense of self. And for decades, for generations, centuries, it's been at the expense of self, and that is one of the big change here. So this idea of showing up to serve, but your team is the first point of service. It's not customers win at all. That's hugely important. Um, we did have an audience question, but seeing the clock run long, I'll ask it and one of you can take it as a 30 second answer. Um, how do you, because it is an important one, how do you overcome the perception that women chefs cannot do the physical aspect as well as the men when you are in an interview? I'm sure you've all encountered that. What's been one effective answer? Lauren, you went up. Um, my answer is that there's plenty of men that can't do it either. <laughs> So, you know, I, I have been in quite a few kitchens where you go to grab something and there's two containers and, and maybe it's just my nature. I always go for the heavier one. Just, I just do. If I can't pick it up, I ask someone to help me. I never say, can you take this for me? But there's been more than one time where there's two containers of things and the man goes there first and they grab the smaller one because they can't carry the larger one. So it's not about, you know strength as a gender. It's about, you know, the desire to work hard and be an equal member of the team. And also some people are just not strong and that doesn't be, it's not because they're a woman. It could be because they're a man. So, you know, we're, we're not, it's not a, it's not a gender role in my, in my opinion. 
very important thing. And I think a key difference that anyone can make there as a leader is creating a collaborative culture to go back to something we talked about earlier, where you ask for help. Doesn't matter what it is about, if it's something that's heavy or it's for anything else, mental health, mm -hmm. anything like that. If you're creating a culture or asking for help is okay, uh, you will really foster more, more collaboration for everybody in the kitchen and a better culture. Mm -hmm. Nina, Virginia, Fiona, Lauren, thank you so, so much for this really inspiring conversation. I have a million notes and I'll use those in my daily life too. So thank you so much. It's been an honor. And I'm turning it back to Jackie. Thank you for hosting this conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you all. And a huge virtual round of applause as we thank all our esteemed panelists, just Virginia, Nina, Fiona, and Lauren. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules to share your candid insights and encouragement with our community of culinary professionals and students today. Um, as Anne said, a lot of great key takeaways and um, really enjoyed the conversation. So based on the conversation, though, I think it underscores that there's much to be done. And so the conversation about women in food service leadership must continue. So please know that ACF supports you and we are committed, in, committed to continuing to provide education, resources, and continuing the conversation to see how we can offer support. But please, let's all make a point to uplift and support each other, all of us, as often as fully as possible. Please be on the lookout for the survey that you'll receive tomorrow with the recording of today's discussion. And you'll need to complete the survey in order to earn your one hour of ACF continuing education. We hope that you'll tune in for our next webinar, which will be on Friday. We will broadcast live from the Greenbrier Resort in West Virginia as Nina Ryan will demo her gluten-free baking tips. And then on March 13th, we'll be traveling virtually to the CI Greystone for a session hosted by our ACF Young Chefs Club president on culinary entrepreneurship. And you don't want to miss Chef Virginia's coming back next month. She'll be sharing uh, her secrets and tips uh, for uh, amazing Southern biscuits. So don't forget to register for that session as well. You're all also invited to join us in the Big Easy as we head to ACF National Convention July 16th to 19th. Um, we will see you in New Orleans to save the date for that, as well as our Mastercraft One Day Educational Events, uh, focusing on culinary education, uh, which will be in New Orleans on July 16th, as well as our Culinary Medicine Summit to be held at the University of Montana on August 19th. Visit acfchef.org and click on the Events tab to learn more and to register for these summits and national convention. And also, if you're interested in James Beard Foundation's Women on, Women's Entrepreneurial Leadership Program, applications will open on May 1st. So more information is available at jamesbeard.org. On behalf of the ACF National Office, thank you again to today's guests. Thank you to Smithfield Culinary for your support of ACF and our educational programming. And thank you for tuning in today. Happy International Women's Day, everyone, and we'll see you all soon. Bye-bye.